Welcome to the ASRM webinar on coping strategies for laboratory professionals during the COVID pandemic. I am Sarah Ramayo, Curriculum Designer at ASRM with my colleague Jessica Goldstein. Joining us are panelists, Dr. Shelley Lee, Director of Psychological Services at the NYU Langone Fertility Center. Dr. Lee is past chair of the Mental Health Professional Group of ASRM and has organized the development of the MHPG certificate course. Next, we have Dr. Janet Jaffe, co-founder and co-director of the Center for Reproductive Psycho Psychology in San Diego, California. Dr. Jaffe served as an adjunct faculty member at the California School of Professional Psychology, Alien International University, and has given talks on reproductive psychology for professional as well as patient audiences across the country. We also have Dr. Tex Vermilia, PhD, Vice President of IVF Lab Operations for Ovation Fertility. Dr. Vermilia serves as a scientific resource and operational advocate for the nationwide network of Ovation IVF labs. Before we begin, please note, all attendees will be muted except the presenters. Time at the end of the presentation will be reserved for questions. Please type your questions in the question chat window at any time. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the presenters during the allotted question and answer time. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ASRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for notifications. I will now turn this webinar over to our first panelist, Dr. Lee. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation and this webinar. My presentation is Lifestyle Management During COVID-19. In this unprecedented global pandemic, we are all feeling anxious, alarmed, and concerned. Some of us are leading to worst case scenarios and losing focus on what is meaningful and positive in our present and in our futures. This can have a profoundly negative effect on our personal lives, our social interactions, and our ability to work productively and effectively. In this short presentation, I will offer strategies and techniques, simple practical tools that can significantly improve how we feel and how we function. I have nothing to disclose. The learning objectives are to understand aspects of the human stress response, to learn strategies and techniques for managing anxiety and fear, to set plans for self-care both body and mind, understand the importance of focus to mental health, and modify behavior to seek positive experience and social connection. COVID-19 has, for all of us, created a tremendous pause in our lives and our work. Of course, the shock of the pandemic is unsettling and fearful. But this pause, this sheltering in place, can also be viewed as an opportunity. It's an opportunity to re-examine what is really important to us, what has value and what has meaning, and separating these things from our automatic behaviors, thoughts, and actions that are irrelevant, that weigh us down and may even harm us. It's an opportunity to improve immediate well-being and modify behavior in a way that will have a positive impact on our present circumstances and on our futures long after this pandemic is over. Let's talk about anxiety. Of course, we are all feeling fear and stress. The first step in managing anxiety is to recognize it and recognize that we are afraid. Experiencing fear and uncertainty at this time is natural, rational, 
and it's even healthy for us. In threatening situations, our brain has a very old, helpful alarm system, which signals the need to be on higher alert and vigilance for threat detection. This helps us to prioritize self-protective -be behaviors and protect those that we care for. But often, we jump to scenarios in our mind and find it very difficult to guide ourselves back to what is normal. Catastrophic thinking, that is jumping to the worst case conclusions, can spill us down a dark tunnel of disorganized, hopeless, and helpless behavior. Catastrophic thinking only increases stress. If our brain sends out a high alarm signal, shouting internally, catastrophe, death, this can trigger a flight, fight, or freeze reaction preparing our bodies for an extreme response. But of course, an extreme response at this time is not helpful. There's no saber-toothed tiger lurking in the wings. We do not have to slay a beast or run for our lives or freeze so a predator won't find us. We have to stay calm, stay contained, and make good decisions for ourselves and our loved ones. It's normal in stressful circumstances to fall into negative self-talk. We're all aware of this. Self-judgment, self-blame, self-criticism are not helpful. These are dysfunctional thoughts that really increase our anxiety, and they also encourage guilt. We can modify our stress response with realistic thinking, pragmatic and constructive actions, and self-compassion. Acknowledge that what you are feeling is valid. Say to yourself and say out loud, my fears are understandable and it's okay to feel afraid. Next, we want to limit our exposure to media. It's so easy to become overly focused on news and information updates about COVID. Our email boxes are filled with these things. The television is filled with them everywhere we turn. Some of the news programs are so dramatic and alarming, they truly undermine positive thinking and they raise to red our internal alarm. So choose the best source for your news and limit this time to a very maximum of an hour a day. You might split this up and maybe read a little bit in the morning or watch something in the morning and a little bit in the afternoon or evening. And if you do this and really keep it to a minimum, of one hour each day, and if you can take that down day by day, good. Never get absorbed in dramatic news coverage just before sleep. In taking control of our mental health, we must separate problem solving from worry. Problem solving sets goals and is forward thinking. Worry is thinking about something we can do nothing about. Worry kidnaps our energy from productive thinking. It's like being stuck in the mud and spinning our wheels only to make things worse and worse. Most importantly, the more attention and time you give to worry, the more you reinforce it. A simple cognitive technique or task to contain worry is to schedule a regular time each day for quote unquote, worry on purpose. Sit down with a pen and paper for 10 minutes at this set time and write down everything that you're worrying about. When 10 minutes is up, stop writing, put that paper aside. The next day at the same time, sit down and write down your worries for another 10 minutes, 
and then put the paper aside. Writing things down gives words and concepts to generalized anxiety. The more you can articulate your worries, the more you can begin to assess what has relevance and what does not. This gives you control. The task of worry on purpose, generally, it's, it sort of starts out very slowly and a little clunky. But as you continue the practice, it really does help to contain worry to the specific time you have set. When you recognize that you're worrying outside of the designated time, give yourself permission to stop and wait until the designated worry time. Remember that problem solving is very different than worry. Let's examine a little more closely what increases our stress and what decreases our stress. In the human stress response, there are two things which increase tension and anxiety, unpredictability and lack of control. When humans have predictive information, the stress response is lowered. So, for example, when we hear about the progression of the pandemic in Wuhan or South Korea, Italy or Spain, and understand the positive direction towards improvement and resolution in these countries, it's good news. We extrapolate that the same thing will happen in our neighborhoods, cities and states. We have predictive information about the direction the pandemic is likely to move. Even in New York City, with a devastatingly high daily death rate, the good news is that the rate is leveling off and will, we predict, continue to decline. Predictive information lowers stress response. Taking control also lower stress response. We know that worldwide government and healthcare facilities are scrambling to do the best they can to take control. Our healthcare workers have shown remarkable courage, compassion, and resilience. As individuals in these unprecedented times, we have a great opportunity for important and necessary change. We can and must take control of our bodies and take control of our minds. So, how do we take control? We take control through self-care. Care for your body and care for your mind. Remember, we need to be able to take care of ourselves before we can truly take care of others. Self-care is not selfish behavior. It's giving ourselves the opportunity to be the best we can be with grace and excellence. So let's start with self-care for the body. This includes exercise, diet, and sleep. Exercise, physical movement, is one of the most powerful anti-anxiety techniques we have. We all know that when we go to the gym and really work out hard and get all those beta endorphins running around our system, we feel great. So as we're sequestered, set a strategy each day for physical exercise, whether it be yoga, Zumba, weightlifting, Pilates, or just running in place. There are many options online, and by experimenting and searching, you'll find the one that works best for you. You might even choose a potpourri of all different kinds of exercises during the week and have fun with it. If you have access to outside spaces where you can keep a safe social distance, take a walk or a run each day. Swing your arms around and give your muscles a good stretch. You can do this with a family member or virtually join a friend. In your homes, you might even turn on your favorite music and dance. 
Physical movement is our great gift and resource. Structure your time each day to be sure you embrace this gift. Next is diet. During this COVID time, we can make significant modifications in diet that really can improve our health and well-being. We no longer have to grab junk food and fast food on the run. But of course, making nutritious meals, having healthy fruits, nuts, and snacks available requires planning. Dig out those old recipe books that have gathered dust for years on your shelf and find cooking projects that will be interesting and fun for you and your family and friends. Many people, I hear this from so many of my patients, are cooking together through teleconferencing, coming up with great recipes and having a laugh at the same time. Make an effort in terms of diet to limit intake of sugars and desserts. It's fine to have these on the menu, but we know that in any healthy diet, limiting sugar and junk food is challenging. This is an opportunity to modify old habits and set new patterns that will contribute to your overall health and well-being. With regard to sleep, set a regular schedule for going to bed and waking. If you are a person who wakes up in the middle of the night and lays there thinking and worrying, get out of bed and go to a quiet place in your house. Go to the same place each time. And there, read, meditate, listen to music, let yourself cool down, and when you start to feel sleepy, go back to bed. As much as we need to take care of our bodies, we also need to take care of our mind. Mental health depends on our focus, how and where we deploy our attention. Where we focus will determine what our experience is and what our reality is. Mental health also depends on positive actions and things that we initiate and engage in as we're moving through this. We want to be mindful helpful, and engage in meaningful distractions. There's hobbies I'm sure many of you would love to get back to, games with your family, creative projects. We want to engage with others and be socially connected. We want to remember to laugh and to have fun. Now, let's look a little bit more carefully into focus. Focus refers to an individual's ability to direct mental attention and effort to the most relevant information in the environment. And we, we all have a choice every moment about where we deploy our focus. We know that negative emotions and anxiety will limit our field of vision and perception. It just they shut us down. We can't see what's out there in our world. These things, anxiety and ne negative emotions, prevent mindful attention to the present, distort perceptions and cognitions, and when we focus on negative thoughts, this determines our reality. Now, specific behaviors we want to decrease are zoning out, and taking it out. Zoning out behaviors include mindlessness, emptiness, and being out of touch with self and others. We all know that when we zone out, we disappear. In the most extreme, this is dissociative behavior, breakdowns in memory, awareness, identity, or perception. Zoning out is involuntary, and it's generally a defense against stressful circumstances. It's an extremely unhelpful behavior. We also want to avoid taking it out. Anxiety 
begets frustration, and we all often take it out on those around us. We want to decrease judgmentalness, negative appraisal, interpersonal conflict and stress, and absence of flexibility. When we recognize that we are focusing on the negative, zoning out or taking it out, we want to stop. This is the cognitive behavioral stop technique. So first of all, recognize that you're doing something that is not helpful to you. Label it, give it a name. Then in your mind, see a big red stop sign and follow the acronym S-T-O-P. Stop to recognize your dysfunctional behavior. T, take a step back. What are you doing? What are you thinking? Is this helpful? O, observe your vulnerability. Observe your level of anxiety and unproductive cognitions. And then P, proceed with caution, making good personal decisions and choices. Again, I'm going to say it. stop. S, stop to recognize your dysfunctional behavior. T, take a step back. O, observe your vulnerability. P, proceed with caution. You're giving yourself a pause to put yourself on the right track again. Instead of negative focus, we want to keep our focus on our present and project to our futures. The specific behaviors we want to increase are mindfulness, hopefulness, helpfulness, humor, and fun. Research in positive psychology demonstrates that it's not the magnitude of positive experience that counts for emotional well-being, but it's the frequency. So we have to make an effort to put our focus on positive, even little things that increase our ability to hope and project into our futures. Defer your attention to seek and to find. I'm going to make a list of some of these things. Joy, serenity, hope, amusement, awe, gratitude, interest, inspiration, and love. For those of you who tend to focus on the negative, this chart is a way to moderate and shift your focus and percep perception. Instead of thinking about disaster, death, and worst case scenarios, and COVID-19, you are now going to be seeking out and recording positive daily experience. I call this chart the treasure hunt. Deploy your attention to seek and to find these experiences. Record where and when you encounter these meaningful, subtle, positive events. Give them a context so you learn how to manage your mind and manage your focus. You will learn where to seek and where to find these treasures. Remember that where you deploy your focus determines your reality. Every moment we have a choice about where we place our attention. Keep it positive. Finally, social connection counts a lot. People count a lot. During this COVID time, reach out to friends and family. Catch up with the life events of others. Hear and listen to their stories. Tell your own stories. If you are feeling helpless, take the opposite action. Be helpful. Write a card or a kind note to someone who might be lonely. Drop off food to an elderly neighbor. Find lighthearted jokes and inspiring videos to share virtually with others. So in summary, our challenge today is to learn to accept, adapt, and adjust to this unique circumstance. 
Our challenge is to moderate our stress response and take the opportunity to become more mindful, stay present, be aware, and to gain insight into our strengths and capabilities. Our challenge is to take care of our bodies and take care of our minds, to take care of our families and to take care of our loved ones. We know that the COVID situation will improve over time. We can work on social connectedness and interpersonal effectiveness, even as we are staying at home. We can do this with the people we live with and work with. We can also do it virtually with people we care for and love. These are skills that will last long after the COVID pandemic is over. Thank you. I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Janet Jaffe. Thank you, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, This is Janet Jaffe. I'm a clinical psychologist in San Diego with the Center for Reproductive Psychology, and um, I want to thank Dr. Lee for a great presentation. I think that some of what I will talk about, uh, I'm going to just talk about it from a different aspect, but a lot of it is um, the same message, and I have nothing to disclose. Um, So just a quick overview of what I'll be discussing. Um, First of of all, I'm going to define trauma. And uh, this is something I use with both fertility patients, and now I will be using it with you. And um, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of similarities. Um, We're going to discuss the disruption of core beliefs, again, for both fertility patients and professionals. affected by COVID-19. We'll also focus on coping strategies. And lastly, we'll explore the concept of post-traumatic growth, the sort of silver lining that may accompany the traumatic uh, events that we're experiencing. Okay, so the definition of trauma. Um, As defined in the DSM, which most of you probably know is our the Psychologist Diagnostic Bible of Professionals, um, and the specific diagnosis of PTSD um, is very much um, focused on exposure to actual or threatened death, injury, or sexual violence. We often think of trauma in this regard as a one-time horrific event, like an accident, an earthquake, a shooting. But as you'll see in the second definition of trauma, uh, trauma can also be described as the disintegration of one's entire inner world and self-narrative. For our patients, this narrative is what I call the reproductive story. That is the core beliefs and assumptions about creating a family that have been completely altered. But we all have stories to tell. As professionals in reproductive medicine, we too have a reproductive story as well as a professional story and a personal story of our hopes and dreams. COVID-19 has disrupted our internal self-narratives as well. So there's a difference between a single a trauma that is a single one-time event, usually centered in one part of the world. Uh, for example, a school shooting. It leaves everyone horrified, but has a very direct, different impact if we are not directly hurt by it. It's not as if we are not affected, but the immediacy of it does not necessarily disrupt our daily life. We grieve, we go on. When someone struggles with fertility, it is not a single event. It can last for months, if not years and wears away at a person's reserves, financially, physically, and emotionally. And patients can't fully grieve because they continue to hold out hope as they move forward in their, uh, in their medical procedures. COVID-19 is similar to reproductive trauma in its sense of chronicity. We have no idea when this will end and when the world will feel safe again. And unlike other trauma, it's not limited to a specific area 
or to a defined group. We are all in a collective trauma sta traumatic state right now. We cannot grieve as we are in the middle of this devastating event. Figuring out when the rules have completely changed is the challenge. So these are some of the general core beliefs that we have. We all have them. Uh, before COVID-19, your morning may have looked like uh, something like this. Uh, the alarm goes off, the coffee pot goes on, you decide what to wear and get ready for the day. Whether conscious or not, we all expect that today will be similar to yesterday and that tomorrow will be like today. There is a comfort in the predictability of our lives. However, with COVID-19, the world is no longer the safe, orderly place we can count on. It's as if the rug has been pulled out and everything, including the coffee cup, is flying in the air without knowing how or when all the pieces will land. Plans we have made no longer look the same. We no longer feel that we are in control. So as a medical professional, what are some of your core beliefs? We have trained for a long time, long and hard, to be able to help fertility patients, and we take pride in the work we do. We play a crucial role in one of the most important parts of people's lives, helping their dreams of having a family come true. Because this may be on pause right now, it not only affects our patients dramatically, but us as well. So what happens when our core beliefs are disrupted? What has COVID-19 done to us? All the things we could count on are no longer certain. Our beliefs in how the world is and how the world should be are fundamentally shaken. Indeed, with the uncertainty of how long this may go on, our self-narratives are being challenged, potentially threatening our health, our relationships, and our financial security. And it's really important to note that when the self-narrative is challenged in a dramatic way, the very meaning and coherence of life can feel threatened. So what are some of our worries? Working in a clinic or hospital setting comes with its own set of anxieties. Um, with the news uh, that Governor Cuomo has declared reproductive medicine a necessary service, we are faced with even more uncertainties. Um, if your clinic has remained open, uh, that's one uh, scenario. Uh, if it hasn't been, will it open and under what conditions? Will, pa will patients feel safe to return? Will you feel safe to return to work? What risks are you taking and willing to take? How will this affect your future and the future of your family? And again, there's, there's so many multiple layers to the worry as um, Dr. Lee suggested, it, we need to figure out how we can uh, help ourselves. So some of the personal reactions that we have when we are faced with trauma um, it hits us on so many different levels. Emotionally, while staying at home and sequestering oneself from others is essential to protect your physical health, the isolation and lack of routine can lead to increased mood disorders. Your sleep may be disrupted. You may be sleeping more or having insomnia. You may be having nightmares. Likewise, your food consumption may look different. You may be eating to fill boredom or drinking more alcohol. And as Dr. Lee had pointed out, these are warning signs. Financially, there's a lot of concern. What if I am no longer employed? How long can I last if furloughed? How do we survive? The uncertainty of the future increases stress. Again, we take comfort in routine. And finally, relationship issues. Don't be surprised if relationship discord arises or worsens at this time. Remember, everyone is stressed right now. You are probably spending much more time together than usual, and your partner is having intense feelings as well. 
try to have empathy, and cut each other some slack. Many of you may have kids at home. Their routines have been upended as well. And there may be times when you feel like pulling your hair out, but it's, it's not helpful. For others with grown kids or who have elderly parents living on their own or in nursing homes, the worry just doesn't stop. This sense of helplessness can indeed make us feel like we are running on empty. So some coping strategies. Um, I'm not going to repeat a bunch of uh, or what Dr. Lee has suggested, but I will talk a little bit about the difference uh, in cognitive therapy and narrative therapy. So cognitive therapy at its core um, has us look at our underlying assumptions. The key here is how to assess and change our negative thought patterns into positive ones. So when our emotions take over, our ability to be rational and process traumatic events can falter. It's common for people to fall into a rabbit hole of negative catastrophic thinking. For example, we know that school is closed for now. And catastrophic thinking would be, what if it doesn't open next year? And then what if my kids fall behind? They'll never catch up. They'll never amount to anything. Their lives are ruined. End of the world kind of thinking is not helpful in reducing one's anxiety. Instead, being able to recognize the negative thinking patterns and replace them with hope. For example, great people are working on vaccines right now, and maybe my kids will pursue that in the future. Maybe they will be inspired by what's going on. And that can absolutely turn down the dial on our worry gauge. So it's some concrete actions. Do things that make you feel good and bring you joy. Exercise, as Dr. Lee said, even if you have to force yourself. Exercise under the best of circumstances can be difficult. And now you might have to force yourself even more. Allow yourself to disengage and zone out with things like puzzles or movies. Try something new. There are lots of courses online now for free. And again, limit your news intake. It can truly be overwhelming. Removing yourself from the trauma, even for a short time, allows your brain and your body to regroup and find relief. It gives it a rest. So here, here, another way of coping is through narrative therapy. And I use this with patients all the time. I remind them that... Um, we have a story, and it's essential to talk about our story, where we were, where we are now, and where we hope to be. When this concept is introduced to reproductive patients, it allows them the possibility of creating a different ending to the story than they had originally thought. With that, they are able to regain a sense of control. And what's important is that these stories need to be told. Likewise, with COVID-19, your story needs an outlet. Having a place to share your concerns and tell your story provides relief. You may choose to talk to a partner or close friend, but remember that they too are going through their own trauma and anxiety. You may also consider reaching out to a therapist with telemedicine where you can receive support vent your feelings of anger and frustration, all in a non-judgmental, safe environment. I think it's also really important to remember that all stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. When people are in the middle of a trauma, it feels as if it will continue this way forever. We know how this pandemic started, but we don't know how or when it will end. And so the question remains, how will we regain control and what does the new normal look like? It can help to remember that this too will end and maybe not all for the worse. This leads me to the concept of post-traumatic growth. This is a phenomenon that creates a new narrative from a traumatic experience 
and converts the trauma and loss into something positive and meaningful. This is not to imply that the story has a happy ending. It's that we can use the trauma to grow. How we collectively grow from COVID-19 is yet to be seen. But we can already see a spirit of increased caring and empathy. Neighbors are shopping for each other. Friends are finding new ways to reach out. The fact that we are working together in this unprecedented time can provide a glimpse into the positive. I'm going to leave you with this quote by Joseph Campbell. We must be willing to let go of the life we have planned so as to accept the life that is waiting for us. We all face unexpected trauma, loss, and grief. And to move forward with life in spite of these hurdles is the real lesson for all of us. Thank you so much. And now I am going to turn it over to Dr. Vermilia. Hi, thank you very much um, for allowing me to participate in uh, this webinar and great uh, talks by Dr. Lee and Dr. Jaff. Um, from a laboratory perspective, um, and here are my disclosures, um, but from a laboratory perspective uh, and overseeing multiple laboratories within the Ovation Fertility Network, um, unfortunately, uh, we've had to deal with um, the, the, the COVID and, and react to the market uh, needs and obviously a decrease in volume and, and patient procedures. Um, so it has obviously put a, a lot of stress on the corporate team as well as uh, the employees um, of the labs that we've worked so hard to to build and, and retain. And I think the, the biggest question that a lot of the uh, laboratory staff and uh, administrative staff and support staff in, in our laboratories have asked is, you know, when is this all gonna be over? And uh, when will I be able to return to a, a potential job or will I will I have a job to return to? So it's it's really difficult to gauge um, and and identify when we will be able to kind of open uh, doors um, in order to help facilitate uh, patients coming through as well as wanting to make sure that our uh, employees are kept safe uh, while opening up uh, laboratories as well as uh, making sure our patients are kept safe. So we've done our due diligence on um, really establishing some very um, disinfecting, uh, cleaning protocols for the laboratories as well as the you know, waiting rooms and uh, kind of just waiting to see uh, when uh, the clinics open up to where patients are then you know, sent to the laboratory for laboratory procedures. So it's, it's been difficult to gauge. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a little bit of uh, light at the end of the tunnel as uh, some laboratories and, and some clinics are starting to see patients and um, stimulations are, are starting to to begin and uh, start up again. Uh, so we're just uh, waiting to hold uh, hold on to to see how this where this takes us. And hopefully, as the volume you know begins to increase, we'll be able to bring uh, individuals out of furlough um, in order to support um, our clinics and and support our patients uh, by providing laboratory services. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the the new normal is and whether or not we will get back to the normal uh, procedural volumes that we're used to uh, pre-COVID and uh, hopefully with the intent to, to bring back those individuals and, and rebuild our laboratory teams accordingly. So a very interesting time indeed and uh, hopefully within the next month or so we'll be able to have a, a better understanding as to uh, where we are and where we stand. Thank you. We will now open up the floor to take questions. For our panelists, please send in your questions through the question chat box located in the gray toolbar to the right or bottom of your screen. Jessica Goldstein will be moderating this session. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists for a very interesting uh, presentation. The first question I have is if staff are furloughed, how can they best stay engaged to ensure that they'll have a job to come back to? Dr. Vermilia, would you like to handle that one? Sure, I can start with that. Um, so with, pay, uh, with, with employees being furloughed, um, you know, it's furloughed is, a, is a, not really a legal term, but it's, it's a way of, of acting a bit of a pause um, from, from non-employment. So there are strict um, uh, employment laws around individuals that are being furloughed, and that is that they're not really able to do any sort of work uh, related to where they, you know, what they're previously doing. So it's difficult, and, and we um, 
have have those individuals that are on furlough cannot you know work uh, per se for for us. However, uh, active engagements through um, you know webinars, free webinars, and and the ability to you know continue to increase their their bandwidth of, of knowledge um, for their field. Uh, but other than that, they're really sort of kind of on their own to you know, take the initiative to to keep their mind going and and uh, uh, still stay engaged uh, without uh, properly doing work for the organization. Thank you very much. This question is from another attendee. Um, how can clinic professionals assist patients during this difficult time emotionally? Perhaps, Dr. Lee, you could start? I'm happy to take that. Well, I think without question, our own experience um, encourages us to reach out with compassion and patience with those that are struggling as they go through the fertility process. I think it's extremely helpful to be able to listen to people's stories and let them know that there is an opportunity for hope and change and things will evolve to a new place that will be meaningful and and hopeful. Um, the more time you can give to patients, I know that we all have short times, but right now, with this, we really can take the time to listen, to embrace, to care for, and I think that makes a big difference for any of our patients. Can I add to that? Um, I I think that um, listening is often when when people are asked to listen to someone's um, feelings, we often get um, we often feel like we're not doing enough by listening. We often feel like we have to solve the problem, and for forgetting how much how important it is to really listen and validate what people are going through. We don't have all the answers right now. Um, will people be able to move forward with their fertility? Um, experiences probably um, exactly when and what that looks like we may not know right now and it's frustrating but but hearing someone's frustration and validating it is enormous enormously helpful thank you this is a two-part question one part practical for dr. Vermilia which is how do you plan to bring back IVF lab staff by seniority, skill set, or pay grade? And then the second part of that is more for the psychologists, and that is um, some people are feeling a lot of regret for not taking advantage of educational opportunities that were afforded to them earlier. How do they deal with that regret? To go first to Dr. Vermilia. Yeah, great question. Um, so a lot of our laboratories have gone into a, a skeleton crew concept in which uh, we have a minimal amount of individuals uh, from the main team that have been able to um, go to a, a reduced hourly schedule um, in order to come into the laboratory to maintain equipment, uh, check on our uh, precious cryopreserved uh, materials. Um, and some, some laboratories are still doing some frozen embryo transfers and some andrology work. So those individuals on the skeleton crew have been able to to handle uh, that lighter volume, uh, but the idea now is that as the volume you know, continues to potentially increase, um, based on skill set really of those individuals uh, that have been on furlough, the idea is to um, gradually bring them back onto the team um, and try to, to uh, distribute hours accordingly. Uh, of course, the big thing is is benefits, uh, medical benefits and health benefits, and how best to um, find that fine balance with allowing those individuals to meet the minimum requirement of hours in order to obtain uh, health benefits uh, without having to go to COBRA or, or some other alternative. So it's it's really a struggle, and a lot of it is is volume dependent, and that's just the big unknown. Um, and I think uh, over nine laboratories uh, across the nation, it's really going to be market dependent and market driven. 
Thank you very much. Dr. Jaffe, would you like to tackle the second half? I'm not exactly clear about um, what that the question is referring oh, to. Is sorry. it? Uh, so I'm go ahead. The question is if you have some lab personnel who are not brought back first because uh, their skill set uh -huh. is smaller or their seniority is lower, and they're dealing right. with regret for not taking advantage of educational opportunities that would allow them to be pulled back first. How do you, what sort of tools can you suggest to help them deal with a dissatisfaction with their own actions? Right, that, that's very complicated, obviously. I don't know if those kinds of educational opportunities are available to them online, but this would be an incredible time to, um, to use their time off in order to help themselves um, to uh, gain more knowledge. Um, regret is is uh, one of those kinds of psychological uh, problems that uh, it can it, it can force you to go down into a rabbit hole. But if we can, you know, say what's past is past, and we have to move forward, um, using that kind of positive energy, I think is going to help people get through it. I, I you know, it's not easy. I, I, I agree. think we all kick. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Jen. Oh, I was going to say I think we can all kick ourselves in the butt sometimes when we're upset with ourselves for not doing something. Is that really helpful? No. Um, it, having the feelings and expressing them is that helpful? Sure. But then we have to go on from there. Thank yeah, you. I think what you said earlier is uh, you know regret is really can really be a very complicated negative way to process information and process our lives. It's looking backward. Looking backward and saying, if only I did this, if only I did that. It's so much more helpful if we can be present and look to our future because that's where our lives are moving. We're, we're not going to be stuck in our past. Regret can be very tricky, and I think it's important to be cautious about allowing yourself to have that backward look. Um, I have another question from the audience, and I'm afraid this might be the last one we'll have time for. How do you recommend that we deal with or work with employees that don't feel comfortable coming in when the clinic is reopened? Dr. Vermilia, would you like to start with that one? Um, sure. We can say that uh, putting together um, very thorough protocols to ensure that uh, not only the, the staff are safe, but the patients are safe. Um, you know, a, a, a deep clean disinfecting protocol that the that the employees are familiar with. Um, you know, I, we can't force people to come to work. Um, we need to make sure that the environment is, is safe and clean. Um, but with the thought that you know, if we're we're taking these extra steps to make sure the environment is is safe and clean for uh, not only our our employees but definitely our patients, um, I think we could be you know pretty rest assured that uh, we're we're doing the right thing. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe. Do you have anything to add about uh, techniques that managers can use to address employees that are feeling uncomfortable? I think this is it's such a huge question because. Everyone is feeling uncomfortable about everything, and it is just, uh, it's overwhelming. I, I'm, I have to go to the grocery store tomorrow, and I'm, I'm really frightened. So I think, um, I think putting into place uh, protocols and allowing patients and staff to know what they are, going through routines with them, double and triple checking, um, that's going to uh, help. I also think time is going to help, and uh, having people be able to go through the go to the clinics and realize that they are safe. Uh, once once sort of uh, word of mouth gets out that this is really uh, going to be okay, uh, I think things will move in the right direction. But it's going to take time. Thank you very much.
We actually have time for one more short, quick, practical question. This one's again for Dr. Vermilia. Will lab protocols be similar to the ones utilized for HIV and hepatitis B? Great question. Um, I think that uh, there's there's potential for it to be that way. Um, you know, again, you know, is is COVID equivalent to the flu, and when patients um, have the flu, are there extra precautions? You know, back then, I think uh, the the thought is that we're going to be definitely more knowledgeable about the situation, and um, you know, with, with a potential infectious you know disease. Looking at looking at laboratory protocols to to see whether or not the the transmission risk is is high and, and what it is that we do other than you know uh, contact and, and being near individuals who are infected, um, I think it's going to allow us to to go back and look at those protocols and see if any adjustment need to be made. Um, but I think definitely just the you know the the patient arriving to the laboratory, the patients are arriving. Um, you know, to the surgery centers, um, and to the clinics themselves. Um, you know, how long will we be taking temperatures of patients? You know, is this going to last for quite a while? You know, that's a, a protocol that we've never done before, uh, but we have implemented now. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, either fades away and becomes a distant memory, or if that's going to be, um, you know, embedded in the cloth of our protocols moving forward. Well, thank you very much. This concludes the question and answer portion. Sarah? Thank you um, to our panelists. Thank you for sharing your insights on coping during this pandemic. And to the attendees, thank you for joining us. You will receive a survey by email after this session. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please keep an eye out for the registration email for Wednesday's webinar by the ASRM COVID-19 Task Force on COVID-19 in pregnancy, what's known and not known. If you have any further questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact us at webinars at ASRM.org. This concludes the webinar. Thank you very much for joining us.